Good morning students. Today I will be discussing on Unit 5 Multiple Antenna Techniques. The outline consists of MIMO system, transmitter diversity, receiver diversity, spatial multiplexing, beam forming, recording, channel state information, capacity in fading and non-fading channels. MIMO. MIMO is an acronym that stands for multiple input and multiple output. It is an antenna technology that is used both in transmission and reception. There can be various MIMO configuration. For example, as the figure shown, the MIMO configuration consists of two antenna at the transmitter side that is at the base station and two antenna at the receiver side called as the mobile terminal. How MIMO works? MIMO takes advantages of multipath. Multipath occurs when different signals arrive at the receiver at various times. Multiple data streams transmitted in a single channel at same time. Multiple radios collect multipath signals. It delivers simultaneous speed, good coverage and reliability improvements is also good. In LTE, there is long term evolution. The base station and the mobile could both use multiple antenna for radio transmission and reception. In LTE, there are three main multiple antenna techniques. Number one is diversity processing. Number two is spatial multiplexing. Number three is beam forming. Diversity processing. In this diversity processing, the transmitter and the receiver both uses multiple antennas such that the signal power increases. It reduces the amount of fading. Fading is nothing but the signal loss. Here, the diversity processing has been used since the early days of mobile communication. Next is about spatial multiplexing. Here, the transmitter and the receiver both uses multiple antennas to increase the data rate. Here, the spatial multiplexing is a new technique since it has been recently introduced into mobile communication. Next one is the beam forming. Beam forming uses multiple antennas at the base station in order to increase the coverage of the cell. Diversity processing. Diversity processing consists of three topics. That is number one is the received diversity and closed loop transmit diversity and open loop transmit diversity. In received diversity, it is mostly often used in the uplink systems. So uh, see the diagram here. The base station use two antennas to pick up two copies of the received signals. Hence, the signal reaches the receiver antenna with different phase shifts, but these can be removed by channel specific estimation. So, base station can add the signals together in phase. The signals are both made up from several smaller rays, so they both subject to fading. If two individual signals undergoes fade at the same time, the power of the combined signal will be very low. So the antennas are far enough apart, then two sets of fading geometrics will be very different. So the signals will be far more likely to undergo fades at completely different times. In LTE, the mobile test specification assumes that the mobile is using two receive antennas. So LTE systems are unexpected to receive diversity on the downlink as well as the uplink. A mobile antennas are closer than base station which reduces the benefit of the received diversity but the situation can be often improved by using antenna to measure two independent polarization. Next one is closed loop transmit diversity. Transmit diversity reduces the amount of fading by using two or more antennas at the transmitter. So it is similar to receive diversity but with a crucial problem. The problem is that the signals add together at single receive antenna which brings a risk as a interference. Two ways to solve this problem. Number one is closed loop transmit diversity and number two is open loop transmit diversity. In closed loop transmit diversity the transmitter sends two copies of the signal in the expected way but it also applies a phase shift to one or both signals before transmission. By doing this, the two signals reach the receiver in phase without any interference. The phase shift is dis determined by precoding matrix, which is calculated by the receiver and fed back to the 
transmitter. Next one is open loop transmit diversity. An implementation of open loop diversity is that an Alamonte technique is used. So this technique implies the transmitter uses two antennas to send two symbols denoted by S1 and S2 in two successive time steps. In first step, the transmitter sends S1 from the first antenna and S2 from the second antenna. In second step, it sends S2 star from the first antenna and S1 star from the second. The symbol indicates the transmission should change the sign of the quadrature component. In QPSK, it is more convenient to represent each symbol using two numbers, which are known as in-phase and quadrature components. So they can be computed by i is equal to a cos phi, q is equal to a sin phi. So a is the amplitude of the transmitted wave and phi is its phase. The receiver can now make two successive measurements of the received signal which corresponds to two different combinations of S1 and S2. It can then solve the resulting equation so as to recover the true transmitted symbols. There are only two requirements. Number one, the fading pattern must stay roughly the same between the first step and the second step. The two signals must not undergo fades at the same time. So both the requirements are usually met. We can combine both open loop and closed loop transmit diversity with the receiver diversity techniques giving a system that carries out diversity processing using multiple antennas, both at the transmitter as well as the receiver. The next one is the spatial multiplexing. If the transmitter and the receiver both have multiple antennas, then we can set up multiple parallel data streams between them in order to increase the data rate. For example, the system with NT transmit and NR receive antenna, often known as NT cross NR in spatial multiplexing system. A basic spatial multiplexing system in which the transmitter and receiver both have two antennas namely in the transmitter the antenna mapper takes symbols from the modulator two at a time and sends one symbol to each antenna. The antenna transmit the two symbols simultaneously in order to double the data rate. The symbol travel to receive the antenna by way of four separate radio parts. So the received signal can be written as y1 which is equal to h11x1 plus h12x2 plus n1. Similarly, y2 which is equal to h21 into x1 plus h22x2 plus n2. x1 and x2 are the signals sent from the two transmit antenna. y1 and y2 are the signals that arrive at two receive antenna. n1 and n2 represents the noise as well as the interference. hij expresses the way in which the transmitted symbols are attenuated and phase shifted. In general, all the terms in the equation above are complex. In the transmitted and the received symbols, xj and x yj and the noise terms ni, the real and the imaginary parts are the amplitudes of the in-phase and quadrature components. In each of the channel elements, hij, the magnitude represents the attenuation of the radio signals, the phase represents the phase shift. So we can simplify this by using real numbers alone. We assume the transmitter is modulating the bits using binary phase shift keying. So the in-phase components are plus 1 and minus 1 respectively. The quadrature components are 0. We will also assume that radio channel can attenuate or invert the signal but does not introduce any other phase shifts. Next one is beam forming. So the beam forming consists of the following topics. Number one is principle of operation. Number two is beam steering. Number three is dual layer beam forming. Number one, beam forming. So in beam forming, the principles of operations is that the base station uses multiple antennas in a completely different way to increase its coverage. Here, the diagram shows two user equipment, user equipment 1, user equipment 2. So the user equipment 1 is long away from the base station on a line of sight that is right angles to the antenna array. So they interfere constructively and the received signal power is high. But considering the user equipment 2, it is an oblique angle 
and receive signals from alternate antennas that are 180 degree out of phase. So they interfere destructively. So the received signal power is very low. The bandwidth is narrower than one from a single antenna. So the transmitted power is focused towards mobile one. So beam width. In a radio antenna pattern, the half power beam width is the angle between half power points of the main lobe which is referred as peak effective radiated power of the main lobe. By applying a phase ramp to the transmitted signal, we can change the direction at which the constructive interference arises so we can direct the beam towards any direction we choose. Generally, we can adjust the amplitude and phase of the transmitted signal by applying a suitable set of antenna weights. Next one is beam steering. Here we can see how the beam steer as well as to calculate the antenna weight. For the reception beam on the uplink, there are two main techniques. Number one is using the reference signal technique and number two is direction of arrival technique. In reference signal technique, the base station adjusts the antenna weight to reconstruct the reference symbol with correct signal phase and the greatest possible signal to interfere with plus noise ratio that is SINR signal to interference plus noise ratio. Then in direction of arrival technique the base station measures the signal that are received by each antenna and estimate the direction of target mobile. From this we can estimate the antenna weights that are needed for the reception. For the transmission beams on the downlink, we can calculate the antenna weight and steer the beam depends on two modes of operation. Number one is time mode and number two is frequency mode. In time mode, the uplink and the downlink use same carrier frequency such that same antenna weights on the downlink is calculated for uplink. The carrier frequencies are different in the frequency mode, so the downlink antenna are different and harder to estimate. For this reason, beamforming is more common in systems that are using in time domain rather than frequency domain. The next one is dual layer beamforming. In this technique, the base station sends two different data streams into an antenna array instead of just one. It then processes the data using two different sets of antenna weights and adds the result together before transmission. In doing so, it has created two separate antenna beams, which share the same subcarrier but carry two different set of information. The base station can adjust the antenna weight so as to steer the beam at two different mobiles. So the first mobile receives constructive interference from beam 1 and at the beam 2 it receives the destructive interference as well as vice versa. By doing this, the base station can double the capacity of the cell. Alternatively, the base station steer the beam to two different antenna on a single mobile so as to double the mobile data rate. The next topic is about pre-coding. Pre-coding is nothing but it is a generalization of beam forming to support multi-layer transmission in multi-antenna wireless communication. There are two types of pre-coding technique. Number one is single user MIMO and number two is multi-user MIMO. In single user MIMO, transmitter equipped with multiple antenna to communicate the receiver that has multiple antenna. In multi-user MIMO, a multiple antenna transmitter communicates simultaneously with multiple receiver. The next topic is about channel state information. The channel state information represents the properties of a communication link between the transmitter and the receiver. It describes how a signal propagates from a transmitter to the receiver and represents the combined effect of scattering, fading and power delay. So channel state information plays a vital role in MIMO system in order to increase the data rate, coverage as well as to improve the efficiency and to reduce the complexity. So CSI is estimated at the receiver side usually called as short term CSI. It is otherwise called as statistical CSI because it depends on characterization of the channel state. The next topic is about capacity in fading and non-fading channels. Here 
the channel can be classified at the transmitter and the receiver so the channel unknown to the transmitter the transmitter only knows the channel statistics such as channel distribution parameters that is capacity c is equal to log to the base 2 i n plus rho by m h h plus which is given in bits per second where the plus as well as h i n and the rho represents the transpose conjugate n cross m represents the channel matrix n cross n represents the identity matrix so the capacity increases by m fold where m is equal to minimum of m comma n next the channel known at the receiver and the transmitter c is equal to log 2 i n plus h q h plus given in bits per second where q represents the covariance matrix of the transmitted signal with the radiated power the shannon capacity of the fading mimo is given by the additive white gaussian noise that is q is equal to p by m into i n 